One, two, three. This is Dr. Alex Avila with Love University, and we're back. I'm an author, psychologist, and speaker. And every week we talk about how to love yourself, others, and a higher nature, how to improve your life and your love, relationships, and your spirituality, your finances, your career, and your health. And we've been having some great guests, and we have a wonderful one today, which actually she's been on here before. And this is her second time. Uh, this is Dr. Paulette Sherman, who is a licensed psychologist, her specialty in romance and love. She was awarded Woman of the Year in Psychology for New York State. She has been a featured as an expert on CBS, Huffington Post, and the New York Times. She's the owner of a dating school and the author of Dating from the Inside Out and the Book of Sacred Baths. So we're going to get, get to learn how to do baths today. Welcome to the show, Paulette. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be on again. <laughs> yeah, we were just talking about how we did the LA Times Festival of Books, and we would love to have you come at some point. Uh, but I think you said you only take one honeymoon a year. Is that right? Not even. This year we're finally <laughs> going. And um, we, we actually did have our honeymoon in Dominican Republic and there wasn't oh. really a cheap cation. So we're, okay. we made it happen that we're going in June. <laughs> okay. Hopefully we can uh, yeah. meet up at some point. Now, let's see this that. question now. You have a really interesting uh, term here. You say um, dating from the inside out and also how to make the right uh, attraction, the law of attraction. So what does that mean? Uh, how do people attract the right mate? How do people attract the right mate? Well, first of all, they have to come from really an authentic place. So yes. one of the reasons I wrote this book a long time ago is that people were playing a lot of games and trying to please and be what they thought the other person wanted. Right. Um, and then the kind of cosmic joke was that they didn't really know each other. And then, you know, <laughs> it didn't work out long term. <laughs> so, um, so I think the first thing is to kind of what I say, marry yourself and know yourself and your essentials, the things you really need and the things that you really couldn't tolerate before you let your unconscious and hormones get in in the mix and choose yes. for you. Um, so that's the first thing. And to be authentic and to be clear what your vision is and to really like your life and yourself not to look to be completed, so to speak, or saved. Yes. Yes. And then to kind of date consciously so that you can go about not looking for the perfect person because there is no such thing, but just the person that matches you in the deeper ways. Yes, definitely. Well, spoken like a true meaning seeker, I think you're Myers-Briggs here. Uh, were you an, an intuitive feeler, if I recall? Time. I believe so. Yes. And, yeah. I, and I remember reading your book like quite a long time ago before you yes. even contacted me. Definitely. So that's what I remember. Exactly. Yeah. So you find meaning in, in relationships in life. Now, you know, for uh, people like us, and I'm similar. I'm a meaning seeker in terms of the personality. You know, we value authenticity and meaning. But there are some schools of thought that people need to also adapt themselves to the situation uh, in terms of dating or relationships. For example, you've heard the old line, uh, playing hard to get. And they actually have some studies where a women are more attracted, to, or actually men are more attracted to women who are somewhat hard to get, even though they may not like them as much initially. Uh, so what do you think of that idea? Should people not necessarily show too much interest in the beginning? Uh, what's the best way to do that? First of all, I'm probably my colored by my own opinions versus yes. maybe what is true for everybody. So if the research says that there must be some truth to that, at least I don't know when that study was done. However, there's also been research that shows that when, now that women are asking men out, um, most of them are like thrilled, 90% of them. And, you know, a lot of them turn into relationships that last a while. So I think things are changing. However, I think, you know, there was once a book quite a while ago, but it had a funny title. It was called um, something like Why Men Love Bitches or something like yes, that. I, I remember might be that misquoting one. it. And I actually preferred that book a little bit to something like The Rules because I felt like one was like playing games and acting like you're busy and it was inauthentic. And eventually, yes. you know, the truth will out, so to speak. But yes. in that book, it was more, it's not that it's great to be a bitch by any means, of yes, course, but of course but I think that was like a shock value title. But the point of yes. that book was like to really like your life and to not need to be completed. And I think there is something to that, that men don't want yes. to be pressured or a lot of times, you know, right. women will just almost not care who they're marrying as long because they're hurrying up and they want to have a baby or get married yes. and they can feel that. So I think the idea of like it being their idea and having their own agenda and taking time sort of uh, does work a lot of times, especially if they're a little bit ambivalent about commitment, which yeah. at least in the past, sometimes men are, right? Yes, exactly. More than women. Well, if you remember, yeah. Paulette, in social psychology, there is the scarcity principle that we value things that are more scarce and they're in higher demand. So I think part of that, people sometimes want to present that aura, you know, that they're in demand in terms of the dating world. But you think, I mean, that is not a good approach to do. Should I mean, let's say they have no dates, uh, they're lonely. Should they admit that upfront to the person they're with? 
<laughs> well, that's not really attractive because they're not your therapist. So okay. I wouldn't necessarily okay. suggest like making it a session and saying, yes. hey, nice to meet you. I'm so lonely. You yes. know, I, however, yeah. you know, they've been finding and I don't know what you think about this, that, you know, there were several um, articles, even in The New York Times, that there were studies that when you ask deeper questions and kind of reveal yourself, I think there were like 30 questions that people ended up getting married. So, you know, it's ironic that in the past, and I don't want to mention any authors in particular, but people have said like, oh, you know, kind of like play it cool. Don't really reveal yourself too much. Don't be needy. Um, But the truth is that if you're really authentic and you go deeper, sometimes the person sees your soul, so to speak, if you're looking for a soulmate and there is that connection. So I think, you know, you could play it either way and probably find support. You're a lawyer, right? But either way for either side. (laughs) But I think, um, you know, you don't want to come. No, neither sex wants to come across needy because that's just not attractive. Right. Right? Exactly. I think the middle ground, uh, but I think at the same time, if you find the right person, then some of the stuff that may not even matter. You know, if you're who you really are, exactly. maybe they're, they're needy too. So two needy people, but you know, can help each other grow or something, right? <laughs> you can have that nice, like, what do you call it? Folia yeah, do relationship. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so that's possible. The other thing is interesting um, these days, Paulette. The idea of yin and yang energy. We've heard about the masculine and yes. feminine energy. You know, that males sometimes are more feminine energy or softer and women are a little more masculine. So in that case, you know, some people are, are given advice. For example, males who are sensitive and shy are told to be more confident and, and, you know, be more masculine. Some women are very assertive, are told to be a little more so-called passive. And so what do you think of that advice? Uh, what should we do in that case? Um, what I wrote about in one of my books, which was, um, when Mars women date, I barely remember anymore. It was, a yes. <laughs> but, uh, and it was about how career women can find the love of their dreams so that they could balance home and, and work. And so in those cases, the reason I wrote that book is because I still think that, you know, when are, men are from Mars, women from Venus could work for a subset of the population that's traditional where the women yes. are more feminine. But I also think that there are some women, maybe like myself, that tend more towards that yang energy where they're big achievers and et cetera. And they might do better with the type of male who's more feminine. Yes. So I think it's all on a continuum, even, right. you know, gay relationships that, uh, you know, I see clients with, with that. So it can totally change. And Freud said that too. I believe that, you know, it's really on a continuum and both people have both. So I think that it's just been something touted in the you know, by a lot of experts that it has to be that way and that there can't be two egos in a relationship as well, which yes. I do believe can be harder, mm. but I don't believe it's impossible because you look at all the couples, like, you know, the high profile couples that really achieve a lot in the world right. together. They're almost like twin flames. Yes, the power, so, the power couples, they call them. Yes. Uh, but then, I mean, you hear of some of the celebrities that get divorced, you know, because they're very competitive as well and they're very high powered. But I think what you're trying to say is that if you really respect and understand and appreciate the other person's style, and we talk about that on love types, that could be the big difference. Because like you said, a, a more uh, yang energy female with a yang energy male, they can respect each other. She could love his softness and uh, maybe artistic nature. He can love her strength and, and, and guidance. But if you don't respect each other, there could be a lot of problems. You can imagine a lot of conflicts and uh, disputes. Yeah, but I, I definitely agree with that. But I also agree that that's no matter what the hell your dynamic is. Or <laughs> like, I mean, because there's going to be differences anyway. That's, but I, yeah, but true. I do think also that I didn't want to... Um, overshoot in the book I was writing and suggest that, hey, it's great for all women to be yang and all men to be yin, because yes, I course. think we all need a balance. And that's one of the right. things I was trying to say. Yes. So, yeah. So it does depend on the, on the combination. But speaking of, you just said that all marriages have conflict. Now, this is a, an interesting question. Uh, is marriage <laughs> You're so de- well prepared. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, well, of course. Of course. Uh, is marriage dead in our society, uh, Paulette? Because we see 50% <laughs> of marriages end in divorce, 60% of second marriages end in divorce. And there's a trend in some countries like Sweden to live together. Cohabitation is increasing. Is marriage dead or is, or not really? I was going to make a joke, and I'm trying to think about the uh, medical term for uh, the stage right before death. It's like kicking and screaming. Oh. I, <laughs> I don't know what that would be oh, Really? Called. Like you're turning, pur- feel- <laughs> you're turning purple, but you still have some life or something, right? Exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that um, there were a couple articles actually a while ago and some reporters reached out to me saying that like people reported that they're living together more and they're not getting married. And, you yes. know, also we know half the people are, are children of divorce, right? And things like like this. So I feel like people yes. are really afraid. And I think there's also some cultural things where number one, marriage isn't as needed, supposedly, like to have kids and whatever. And also women are making more. So they look at men sometimes, which is unfortunate for the men and for the women, I guess, and say, what do I need you for? Right. I can have a baby by myself. Yes. And I and I don't necessarily think that that's always the case. But I think, um, you know, everyone has a right to decide for themselves. And one of the things I wrote about in that book a while ago was I think the last chapter was about how they're all different types of relationships. 
divorce now. And people even cohab don't cohabitate and get married. I read an article about couples that lived uptown and downtown and had kids as strange and don't have meat for dinner, mm. you know. So there's all different types of things. There's open relationships now. So I, th- I don't think marriage is dead, but I think that, you know, just like anything, that the forms are changing and the values are changing. And I also think that, unfortunately, and I see this with my kids as well, like we're, we're getting to be kind of lazy as a society in a sense with like fast everything. Even the dating is just overwhelming amount of options and technology and so many choices. And I think um, marriage is work. It's not easy. And it seems like you could just find someone else and you'd be happier. That's what people think a lot of times. You know, it's, it's interesting. You know, in our recent, uh, we were at the Festival of Books in L.A., the USC uh, one I told you about. And we had an interesting guest who actually talked about the whole technology thing, how you know the new, new generation uh, is, doesn't really want to commit as much. You know, They don't want to buy a house necessarily because <laughs> they can uh, – what's, what's that when they get a house uh, renting? What is that called? Rent, an apartment or uh, – No, it's like some kind of app. What is it oh, called, like Reggie, Air, do that? Airbnb. Oh, Airbnb. yeah, yeah. They do, yeah Airbnb instead of uh, uh, buying a house. <laughs> Uh, Tinder instead of Airbnb getting married, Airbnb. right? So, <laughs> and uh, I guess uh, I don't know. Upworks instead of getting a full time job, uh, permanent. You know, they they want to travel. Do you see that a, a problem now? The lack of commitment in our society. I'm for, smiling for and nodding. I actually really <laughs> relate to hearing that a lot. I do yes. feel like that, and I do feel like you know maybe people are going to start renting dates. <laughs> You know, and and I'm not talking about when I wrote my first book, Dating from the Inside Out. I think I wrote an article I was blogging at the time called like something dating in a Seinfeld generation, because even with him, like he would, you know, date and then find that he didn't she wore the same dress twice or she had food in his teeth, So he would find somebody new. Yes. And, you know, it's kind of like I do feel like sometimes things are very transitory. And I think it is good to have options and to feel like you're independent and things. But. Everything I think that's worthwhile generally requires some work, and that usually entails growth. And so, you know, I don't think that dating, some people date just to have fun and then they move on, and that's fine if that's the stage you're in. But I don't know if you can do that with marriage necessarily, although there have been books written about that as well, like getting married for a few years and then reevaluating. You know, and yes. that some people think that that you know people. I don't know if it's Margaret Mead said that, but people aren't meant to be monogamous their whole life. So people have different mm. views on it. Personally, I view marriage as a spiritual journey, and that's one of the things uh, I'm writing about in my next book. Yeah. Yes, that, that's what I was going to ask you about. Like, you know, from your personal viewpoint, what are the advantages of being married? Because obviously, you know, there's a lot of research <laughs> on, on, yeah. on, on the health, and you know, there's a lot of mental health and stuff like that. To this. <laughs> <laughs> well, give me a couple. I mean, a couple of big things yeah. that we don't even think about. Uh, what's so great about being married? What is so great about being married? Well, I didn't say that it would necessarily be fun, but I think what's great (laughs) about being married is that um, your lifetime partner knows you better than anyone else. I mean, maybe not yourself and maybe not your parents, but really knows you well and sees you. And so they see your highest potential, hopefully, especially if they're your soulmate, but they also see the things that you need to heal in order to become whole. And we don't really see that on our own, right? Because we are just not paying attention. We're swimming in it where it's the, we're like the fish with the water we grew up with. So we don't really see our patterns and sometimes that's really painful. And so when they start to annoy us or hurt us in some way by telling us what we don't want to hear, we think, Oh, you're not nice anymore. We want to get someone who makes me feel great again, like the in love stage. And then we want to move on and get divorced. But if you can kind of work through that, it's an opportunity to learn from opposites, to learn about where you're not seeing things that, you know, you could heal old wounds and things like this. And so to me, that's really a soulmate relationship and we're here to perfect ourselves. So, you know, not an easy sell. That's a growth growth teacher personality, like you just said, right? The meaning seeker, a view of marriage. And that's that's beautiful. But speaking of of this whole idea of uh, improving marriage or making it grow, there are certain like different factors. Uh, One of them, uh, you've heard of Gottman's research. He did uh, videotaped a lot of married couples and looked at their, their physical cues. Uh, it's something called turning away versus turning f- toward. So, yes. for example, one of the partners talks about, oh, I have this great art collection. And the other partner, hey, I'm watching a football game. I can't be bothered. <laughs> or, or, yeah. or, or he says, hey, you know, I'm interested. Let, let, tell me more about it. Uh, and they said that happily married couples turn toward each other 87% of the time. And those are likely to divorce only 37%. What do you think of that idea of turning toward or turning away from your partner? I remember, first of all, I wish you would name it something else. I think he's amazing, but that always confuses me when they say like bids for affection or bids for attention or whatever. I think people don't know what it is a lot of times, but it's what you're saying. Like any kind of little thing, like give me a hug, ask how my day was and you're ignoring me, anything like that that goes into the emotional bank account. What I think is when I first read that, I was kind of in shock because to level with you, I feel like 
most couples I have, including myself, may not even pay as much attention as they used to 33% of the time. Uh, and those people were divorced six years later. Yeah. So it's a really good stat uh, to kind of make you wake up. And I do have that in my book, which is hmm. talking about little ways that you can pay attention yes. to your spouse, because those are the little things that actually add up over time. Yes. And then when there are trouble, there are trouble times, you can pull from that bank account, you know, so it's not like you're doing that with an agenda, but you know, you, it's just so different. I think the way people act when they date and everyone whines to me how difficult dating is. And you know, I can't wait till I get married. And I just look at them. I'm like, Oh, oh they're there. Like, you don't have to know, like, you know, <laughs> dating is hard, but you're, you're everyone's their best self. You kind of like have so much fun when it's the right person. And then there's all the responsibilities and you know, all the, like I'm talking about the things that surface. Um, and that's where the real work, I feel like the deeper work begins and the rewards can be very great, but you know, it's very easy when you're dealing with the laundry and the kids and you know, everything else you have to do and you already got the person to kind of like not pay as much attention, um, and not be on your best behavior, so to speak. Right. Yeah. I like that. You said deeper work and greater rewards. So that's actually a very, um, interesting phrase because you're going much deeper than just superficial, I guess, attraction or you know, comfort or companionship. You're talking about improving each other's lives in a deep way. Uh, so growth, it sounds like it, it's important here. But going back to this idea of, uh, you know, turning away or turning toward, what if you really hate art and you can't stand it? Should you be insincere and say, how can I, uh, let me tell you about the art, but I don't, I want to watch the football or vice versa. Uh, how should they do that? Should they well, try to see, be Well, see, that goes back to the rules, right? <laughs> that book was always like, oh, pretend you love football. Then later they find out you really don't. Yeah, so exactly. I don't think that you should pretend. However, like a lot of therapists and psychologists say, 